Let's get to the specifics of this one new BuzzFeed property. We all know BuzzFeed, obviously, but I don't, I mean, maybe a lot of people do know but Tasty by BuzzFeed, but it was launched in August, probably July, something like that. <clears throat> and it has 1.2 billion views on Facebook in October, which is a large number, obviously, but here's how large it is. It's uh, the next uh, most viewed property on Facebook in October was around 740 million. And then the next one after that was BuzzFeed Food and BuzzFeed Video. And Tasty by BuzzFeed had more views than those two combined. And my question for you is, how did that happen? Uh, so so we, we're always testing new ideas. One of the, the things we, we realized about three years ago was that um, food and lifestyle content was something that people really loved and would share. It also was something where we had a potential to have a bigger impact. So when we did a food article like a clean eating challenge or an exercise challenge, we'd see people following along and posting on social media the food they cooked or the, or, or the exercises they were doing. So we saw that it actually had a bigger impact on people's lives. So even when you look at the metric of sharing, that's meaningful, but someone actually doing something is more meaningful. And that led to making more and more food content. We set up a test kitchen. BuzzFeed Food, which is on BuzzFeed's site, started having some huge successes with um, videos that got tens of millions of views um, that were, were made in our test kitchen. And then our video team in LA said, hey, look at the success they're having. Let's learn from that and make a video uh, property called Tasty that, um, that focuses entirely on distributed content and makes content for, for um, for, for Facebook video primarily, they got better and better at making food videos and have built a massive page. And now BuzzFeed Food and Tasty are two of the largest um, cha media channels on Facebook, and they're, they're both uh, food, food channels. And then Top Knot comes out of, out of this as well. That's another Top Knot by BuzzFeed. Is it also done by the video team in Los Angeles? Is it it's a collaboration between New York and LA. Oh, OK. Yeah. So, um, so what is Top Knot and how does that work? Top Knot is also suddenly, it's one month old and it's suddenly on the list of most popular pages. Like um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fashion. It's, um, we, we realized that uh, there, were, there was, a, you know, one, one piece of this is that, is that because Facebook is so global and BuzzFeed is so global, we're finding that there's opportunities to um, make very visual content that appeals to a large global audience and food, fashion, DIY, design, some of those kinds of areas are really, are really uh, promising places. So the, the, the speed at which you spun up this new brand, Tasty and Top Knot, that's, it's remarkable. What is it like from a, an organizational standpoint? Do you hire like a whole team to do these things and like, oh, that's gonna be our Tasty team? Or you know, do people do new, new work and how does it work? Um, we have a big pool of generalists who are constantly experimenting. Um, we then find that sometimes people get a crush on something, we sometimes call it, where you know when you have a crush on a person, you, you don't know that much about them, you're kind of obsessed with them, you want to spend more time with them. I mean, we have people on our team who have a crush on a platform like Facebook video, or they have a crush on like food videos, or they have a crush on some area, and they go, in, the, in that case, from being a generalist to being someone who just gets obsessive about one initiative, mm -hmm. and we're seeing more and more that those, 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 those are the ways that we really break into something big, is when there's a relatively small group that has some success and then says, I want to go down a rabbit hole and figure out how does this stuff work, and that team or that pod will, will make you know, really amazing work. So you say to people, like, this person's clearly obsessed and they're having a lot of traction, just keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, the, the big, you know, we, we're also experimenting with Facebook video. It's, it's, you can get very large very quickly. The money isn't there yet, obviously. It's, it's you know, lots of people are throwing money after it to get there, to get a lot of views. Um, so far, you're not allowed to monetize the platform. You're, um, you're, Facebook will pay you for suggested video. Mm -hmm. The rates are very low. How do you rationalize it? Well, so Facebook a year ago didn't have video, really a video product at all. And now they are, are you know, generating billions of views for us and lots of views for many other uh, publishers. So, um, and Facebook, what Facebook's sort of superpower is continually improving and getting better over time. So they'll launch a product and they'll, you know, they won't see that as the end point. They'll say, okay, let's launch video. Wow, we got huge user engagement. Okay, now let's try some ways of monetizing with this suggested videos product. Let's try to th figure out other ways to, to, to um, incentivize partners to, to be, make great content for Facebook. 
Um, so I think over the next few years, you will see Facebook um, evolve their product and figure out how to get, make sure that um, people who know how to make great social video and mobile video will make it for the Facebook's platform. And then we need to kind of wait and see how they, how they, what, how they develop. Uh, has, has wait and see ever not worked out? Like sort of faith that a platform is going to develop. There's a lot of traction. It's like, oh, surely there's going to be money made here. And then it just never materializes. Has that ever happened? Or? I mean, it sometimes happens. I think it happens when when the strategy of a platform doesn't match the strategy of, say, a publisher. Okay. Right? So sometimes there's a platform that says, you know, we don't really want to have a bunch of publishers making content. We want it to be personal, or we want it to uh, we want it to just be celebrities doing personal updates or something like that. Um, but I think in, in Facebook's case, um, so much of the Facebook newsfeed is becoming a very dominant way for people to consume news and information and video and images and text and all different kinds, you know, 3D uh, uh, video, which we've been making for Facebook. Um, and, and so I think that if it's more expensive to make content and the only way to have it, the only way to make it uh, people be able to afford to produce this kind of content is to incentivize them or give them, uh, allow them to build a business. Facebook will, will figure out ways to allow people to have good businesses. Okay. Um, so you've been reading about the early Hollywood studios. We talked about a book that you and Zay Frank have been reading at the same time. Uh, yeah, same time. Little book you know, club? Sometimes different, yeah. different, uh, at different paces. Um, but, uh, you know, it, 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 it I, I think that, you know, sometimes people will ask, like, what's a comp for BuzzFeed? And we'll try to, try to compare us to other companies. And when you compare um, BuzzFeed to, say, NBC Universal, who, who just invested in BuzzFeed, we're very different companies. They're a much more mature business. They do much more revenue. The content they make costs a lot more to, to produce. And, and the, it, we're not really that comparable. We're not that similar as businesses. But then when you look at startups, we're not that similar to a Facebook or a Twitter. We're, we hire people who make content, which is a, a, a big difference with these tech platforms. Um, the place where I find the best comps is looking at the early days of media businesses. And it depends. You know, magazines and, well, newspapers was sort of over 100 years ago. Magazines, like, 80 years ago. Um, studios, about 100 to to years ago to 60 years ago. Like, there's these spans where you see people trying to figure out how do you build a business around uh, new, uh, new technologies that didn't exist before, where all of a sudden you can show moving pictures. And then all of a sudden you can show moving pictures with sound. And, and, and how do you end up building a business? And if you look at the, real, the early studios, they were building global um, media businesses um, you know, almost 100 years ago. And, um, and the model really worked because of this distribution that they built out with theaters in all different countries. And um, the, 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 they would have first run theaters, would, the tickets would cost much more, and it would slowly move down to less, um, less desirable theaters. And it would sometimes take a year before you could see the theater, the, the, the movie for, for a discounted price. Um, and so they, they, they were do, figuring out a lot of things that still are, are hugely um, influential on the way the the studios work today. Is the analogy for you, they were distributing you know, their films through this set of theaters, and that's kind of like how we distribute through Facebook? And is it like, or what are you learning? Yeah, so, from, so, yeah. So, so sometimes you can over-analogize. An yeah. um, yeah. But I think the, the big thing we, we, we see is that um, having fixed costs and building out a global cross-platform network is something that um, BuzzFeed's very focused on. So we are able to make content, and that content can be huge on Facebook, can be in our Snapchat Discover channel, can be translated into other languages, and we get the benefit of, of making content across, uh, across a global cross-platform network. Um, our reporter had a, uh, our, our national security reporter had a scoop of, about the books that Osama bin Laden had in his library. And that story was a story for, that we published in the US, but he had all these French books and was a Francophile. And so then we, she could co-author an article in French for our French edition. And so having a bigger network allows us to invest more in reporting, invest more in entertainment. Um, our, our video about making Nutella brownies was like huge globally, and we saw in Brazil and in Germany and France. We can invest more in making content like that if we know that it has these, this larger uh, international uh, uh, footprint, and we can invest more in content if we know that it can go on multiple platforms um, besides just BuzzFeed's site. It can work on Facebook, it can work on YouTube, it can work on Snapchat, it can work in, in different places. And so just to bring it back to the studios, 
that, that actually was very similar to what we saw with the early studios, where first they would make a movie and show it in their own theaters. Then they realized, oh, we need other people's theaters too to make additional revenue. Then they said, oh, we need theaters in other countries. And then there was a period where they said, where they realized that television, which at first they said, oh, television doesn't matter, that television became a way to spend more on movies. Because if you made a movie, showed it in the theaters, then you could sell it to television networks, and they used that as programming. And so all of that, those kind of realizations that being able to have a bigger, more global, more cross-platform network allows you to invest more in content are realizations that I think people are having again today in the digital space where they're, they're seeing the, the same benefits of being global and cross-platform. I'm curious a little bit about the blocking and tackling of like fixed costs uh, for like a story going to other platforms. Do you not have a person who's like a specialist for Facebook or for Twitter or for whatever, what have you? So I mean, so a story is made, how many people are involved in, in, the, in distributing it across different platforms? I mean, I'm sure it's different in every case, but generally. Yeah, so we have, we have some great examples of this, okay. and then we're building out more and more operational capacity to do this. So okay. we have a, a, a um, global translation and adaptations desk where stories can go and get translated in different languages and also changed and adapted for different markets. So, so that's uh, a piece of it. Um, if you look at our Snapchat Discover channel, What's, what, one thing I think is really interesting is it has native content made just for Snapchat that a team in Los Angeles is, is making. And then it has a lot of, of the best things from other platforms. And so it allows us to make something that we would not be able to make if we weren't on many other platforms. But it still has things that are unique for, for Snapchat. And so I think it's a combination. I don't think it's the, the right once read everywhere model. It's the um, have a, have a creative idea and a spark, make lots of things, see which ones end up really working, and then pick the things at the head of the tail to adapt to different platforms and different markets. Okay. Are you worried about focus? I mean, what is your, you know, what, how do you, when you're trying all these experiments, how do you make sure you're doing the one thing you do great well? Um, well, I, I mean, I think what we do well is do a lot of experiments and learn what, okay. what, learn what works and then expand expand on the things that work. And I think when you look at something like Tasty, it's an example of taking, going, going from a core of generalists making, doing experimentation to then having a single purpose thing that you, that you really fo focus on and, and, and expand. Um, and we should be able to build more interesting businesses and initiatives and brands because of all of the knowledge and learning we have from the cross-platform global network. What, um you know, the last time we talked a few months ago, you also mentioned that you read a book about Ted Turner. You know? Yeah, there's this book, <laughs> CNN, The Inside Story, which was a bestseller that's now out of print, so it's easy to get used. Um, and it, it, it is about the early days of CNN when it was a startup. And, you know, they were planning to spend um, something like $30 million in their first year to be on television 24 hours. And the networks at the time were doing a half hour nightly news show for like $300 million a year. So it, it, people thought it was crazy. The costs were so much lower. But they figured out how to use the medium to do things you couldn't do in broadcast. So they could go live to an event and not have to interrupt the sitcom that was on, scheduled to be on or, or the sports game or whatever. Um, and they could do a different kind of coverage and it allowed them to grow. And eventually they ended up spending you know, today, like more than, than the networks do, or, or as much as the networks do. So it was a, a interesting story of, of disruption. And I think people miss the fact that um, things often start in a, in a swashbuckling, like low, low cost, uh, just get it done kind of way, even when they grow into these iconic brands. Actually, search YouTube for the first broadcast of ESPN, and it is like, it is like one of my favorite videos. You like watch the first broadcast of ESPN, and it's like a guy sitting there, like, "Welcome to uh, the New England Sports Network. You know, we have softball on later today, and you know, we're going to bring you all the exciting, you know, things from, you know, it, it, it's like, it, you know, the sets, everything. Just watch it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's a story like about describing a video. <laughs> it was good. Keep Let going. me describe videos to you. There's this one where like a guy bites a finger. A kid, <laughs> one kid bites another. Oh, never mind. I know that one. There's this guy who dances funny. Yep. Let's keep doing this. <laughs> um, so NBC Universal just invested $200 million in BuzzFeed because they want to learn about what you do. What are they learning about you? I mean, how does that actually work? I, I, I mean, I think the learning is really two ways. Okay. You know, because I, I don't know that much about how 
television and film works yeah. to, today. I know a lot about how it works, you know, 50 <laughs> years ago. Um, so we've we've learned a lot from them, seeing seeing how they how they uh, make and distribute and market uh, content, and I think um, hopefully they've learned learned things from us as well. Um, and then in a few areas, we're finding places we can collaborate and actually work on stuff together, um, which which I think will you know be be pretty interesting around the Olympics and some other okay. some other other areas. You do scripted stuff in, in Los Angeles with the Say Frank's team. Is that are one of those if it gets popular all of a sudden it's like, well maybe we'll sell it to Amazon and maybe it'll be a store, you know. A, a yeah, store. I mean we you know we just sold a a, a, a series to uh, directly on iTunes, okay. this Violet series you do you. Um, and it was um, num number one for for like five days on the in the iTunes store ahead of ahead of the Kardashians, so it was pretty pretty cool, <laughs> and um, and uh, that th I, I think some of the some of the places where we'll start with shows will not be put it on television. It'll be more make something, um, you know, like Violet kind of is actually really interesting. It came out of a lot of generalists making content, then having them become characters, then those characters start to live in a character universe, then that they, they start to be stories and fans following around along with their lives. Uh, and then we went from single videos to a collection of 12 videos and made a series with a more of an arc to it, and then, and then released that on iTunes first, and then also online. So you could wait and see it for free, or you could, you could buy it if you couldn't wait. Um, so I think you know some of that actually gets back to you know how should windowing work in the digital age you know and and the the sort of default is like just put everything everywhere always and that tends to be the way we operate but there, I think there are some interesting opportunities just like in the early days of the studios where they said okay here's what first run means here's what second run means here's when we go wide and you know move it to another platform. So I, I think there's there's possibilities there that people are going to figure out over the next few years. Well, we're all watching and admiring, and thanks for doing this, Joan. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Yeah.